Good morning. It's always a pleasure to see friends from overseas. Despite the fact that you don't have much of a voice to express how pleased you are. But just the same, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for bringing us all here, Lord, through far and wide, through the short distances. Lord, we thank you, Lord, but that because of, because of your strength and your grace, we are able to worship in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have to worship. We pray for our brothers and sisters in far-flung places who, by way of legal constraints, may not be able to worship the same way we do. But Lord, we know that we have one God, one Christ, and one church. So for today, Lord, we pray that whatever it is that you would say, Lord, through this feeble voice, you would say with clarity, and you would say with truth and with power. We ask all these things in Jesus' most precious name, and all of us will say, Amen. <clears throat> the title of our message this morning is this. It's called Preserved and Persevering, the Believer's Assurance, taken from 2 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 1 to 15 from the English Standard Version. So if you have your Bibles, kindly turn with me to the second letter of Peter, written sometime uh, in uh, 65 to 68 A.D., or if you like, 68 to 65 A.D. And it begins in uh, verse 1 where it says, <clears throat> Simeon Peter. And if you have the New American Standard Bible, it says there, Simon Peter. Again, I will, I will have to tell you that what you're hearing is not the distortion of the speaker. It's really my voice. So... Verse 1, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained the faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and, our, uh, and, God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more patient to confirm your calling and election. For if you've practiced these qualities, you will never fall. Verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend, to, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Do you know them and are established in the truth that you have? I think it's right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. May the Lord add his blessings upon the reading of his word and all of us will say, this letter, this is the second letter which was written by Peter and he was writing this because as you probably read in the, last, uh, the, in the last couple of verses, he was saying that his time was up. And the reason for this was because he was a prisoner of Nero, and uh, Nero already had made expressions to execute him. That is why he was actually telling and encouraging the believers that he was writing to that this must be something that you have to remember, that you are always, that you have a faith which will last and that it will persevere. Now, um, 
one of the things that you and I always encounter is the trouble with recurring or habitual sins, right? Who here, who among us here does not have a problem with recurring or habitual sins? Raise your hand. Meron ba? We always, all of us have, right? We all of us have the problem of recurring and habitual sins. And one of the things that happen to us is that we are filled with doubt. Nagdududa tayo palagi and sometimes we are, we are brought to even points of sorrow and despair. And one of the most important, the more often, uh, the more, the, one of the most often asked questions that we ask of ourselves during these times is this question. Do we actually know if we are truly saved? Di ba tinatanong natin if we are always, we seem to always be in, uh, burdened with repetitive or habitual sins, we might bring us to the, it might bring us to the point that we ask ourselves this question. How do we know if we are truly saved? Have you asked yourself that question in the midst of your struggle with sin? Have you asked yourself that question? I have. And you know, the Heidelberg Catechism in uh, the Lord's Day 21 actually answered that first, we know that we are truly saved by, Hannah, by, by faith in the written promises of God. It is the objective means by which we can actually know, we can actually appraise, and we can do this every so often. We know that we are truly saved by faith in the written promises of God. Of course, it says there, neither death nor life nor principalities can ever separate us from the love of God. For if, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Those are promises which you can go back to again and again. And these are objective and you can find these in the Bible. The second is this. By the assuring comfort provided to us by the Holy Spirit. We know we are saved if we have the assuring comfort which is provided to us by the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is something which is subjective. This is something because of our intimate fellowship with the Lord. This is something which comes as a result of us praying, as a result of us fellowshipping with, with other believers. We have this kind of comforting assurance that the Holy Spirit for, provides. It's something which we cannot see, but it is something that we feel. So we know we are truly saved by faith in the written promises of God in His Word, which is the objective uh, evidence of uh, our, our salvation. And we have the assuring comfort provided to us by the Holy Spirit. And these things are very, very helpful to us during times when we struggle with repetitive or habitual sin. Now, there are other signs that might point to the genuineness of our salvation. There may also be signs that we know already as, as that we see in ourselves and in other believers that might point to the reality or the genuineness of salvation. The first of which is this. Remember, tatlong letters yan. There are three letter C's here. The first is conversion. So, conversion is when what? What happens here? It is that point in time after the Holy Spirit works in us that we are brought from a state of spiritual death to a state of spiritual life after which we hear the gospel. That's the time that after, after we have been made alive, the gospel now makes sense. The gospel is something we desire. And therefore, it may or may not be accompanied by a profession of faith. It may also or may not be accompanied by a profession of repentance. Ano pa? Second. How about this? A changed life or a changing life. It is a sign that may point to the genuineness of our salvation. And it is a life that is changed. It is a life where the faith that we profess or the repentance that we profess is something that we, not, we don't just profess, but we practice. Diba? From professing to practicing. So it is a life where our faith is practiced and it is a life where our repentance is practiced as well. And third, Another sign that may point to the genuineness of our salvation is that Christ remains Lord and Savior even in the face of certain death. Even in the face of crippling disease. Even in the face of life-threatening disease. It is seen in us that during this time when our bodies are, are torn by disease and or, or we are facing the prospect of imminent death that people still see that our continents revolves around trusting God and having Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So conversion, having a changed life, and having Christ remain in us as Lord, as, as Lord and Savior. Now, 
There is one single thing, one single point here that is common to all. How do we know that we are truly saved? We are truly saved because of the presence of faith in us. Faith is that which, ano sabi sa Hebrews? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the substance of things unseen. So, faith is that which is common to all of us. And I would submit to you, my dear brothers and sisters, this thesis statement for this morning. That the faith we have been given is the faith that preserves us and causes us to persevere. So, basahin natin ulit ha. This is our thesis statement this morning. The faith that each and every one of us has, that you, and ha that you have, that I have, is the faith that preserves us, and it also the faith. It is also the faith that causes us to persevere. Now, we have to ask ourselves this question. Therefore, what can we learn about the faith which preserves us and causes us to persevere? Ano ang pwede nating matutunan do sa pananampalataya na nasa sa atin? What do we say about the faith that is common to us all? First, based on our passage of scripture, our faith in Christ comes with both the power to equip us in life and godliness as well as the power to free us from worldly corruption. Let me say that again. Our faith comes with two sources of uh, two sources of strength or two two uh, sources of power. One is the power to equip us in life and godliness and the other the other one is the power to free us from worldly corruption. It has two two kinds of powers. Reading to you from verses 3 and 4 where it says. Now, his, his here is talking about, talking about Jesus Christ. Anyone who has faith in Jesus Christ has divine power. Now, reading to you from verse 3 and 4 where it says. His divine power, the divine power of Jesus Christ, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. There are two sentences uh, written uh, in red there. And that, that highlights what our faith can do. Our faith through the divine power of Jesus Christ, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And our faith through the divine power of Jesus Christ is such that we have escaped corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So what does this mean? What does this mean? The gift of faith which came upon conversion carries with it the enabling for us to know how to live godly lives. It also carries with it the definitive enabling to protect us spiritually from the contaminating effects of sin in the world. Now, what does it do? Let's just repeat this. It enables us to know. It gives us the knowledge to know how to live godly lives. And it also gives us the protection by which we are free from the contaminating influences of this fallen world. So, dalawa, this is what it does. This is what the faith that we all have can do for us. Now, next please. What can be seen after surrendering one's life to Christ is the desire to turn away from sin and worldly habits and yet what is not seen is the spiritual event where our preservation is guaranteed. At the point of justification, at the point of faith, we receive, we, we receive the gift of faith. This gift of faith makes us aware that we have to live godly lives. That's the faith that makes us aware that we have to pursue sanctification. But there's also this faith that is indelible in us, whereby it protects us from the contaminating influences of the world. So the sin in the world is something which is no longer palatable to us because we have this kind of faith. And there is also that aspect of this same faith that makes us desire to move forward, that this makes us desire to pursue sanctification, Pers that it makes us desire to pursue godly living. Now, both of these, I must say, say again next, Anna, both of these came from the same gift of faith. Now, next. 
A person with genuine saving faith, genuine, genuine saving faith, has the desire to change. All of us here, all of us here, who has the desire to change until now? Can you raise your hand? All of us have the desire to change. All of us have the desire to be godly. However, should the desire to change start to wane in the future for some reason or, or another, it does not necessarily mean that your faith is not genuine. That's a comforting thought, diba? Right? Sometimes we are, we are burdened by so many things. Sometimes we are experiencing pain, we are experiencing trouble, we are experiencing relational difficulties, but yet, yet, we know that we have faith, but the faith is not the same. The subjective faith that makes us want to, to be godly is not, does not have the same, the same push. By the grace of God, it does not necessarily mean that your feelings determine the actual genuineness of your faith. Do you, do you, do you get what I'm saying? So, a person with genuine faith generally has the desire to change, but if that desire wanes at some time in the future, it does not necessarily mean that your faith is not genuine. Because God determines, and if God plants the faith that's inside us, nothing and no one can remove that seed of faith from in us, right? So that's, that's very much true. Now, just a recap of our first point. So how do we describe the faith that preserves and perseveres? Our faith in Christ comes with both the power to equip us in life and godliness as well as the power to free us from worldly corruption. Dalawa lang po. Our faith comes with the power to equip and the power to free and to preserve. That's the first point. Second, our faith in Christ allows us to build upon it other qualities that make us effective and fruitful as believers. Let me say that again. Our faith in Christ allows us to build upon it other qualities that make us effective and fruitful as believers. Parang buto, no? Parang seed. Tumutubo. So, reading to you from verses 5 to 8 where it says this. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Notice, ha? It's a command. It's a command. For this very reason, since you have, the pow you have been given the power to be equipped and the power to be free, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read that again, the, 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 the sentence in red. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does this mean? Next, please. Genuine living faith never ends with just a claim to believe. Do you believe that? Genuine living faith never stays just as a claim to believe. If you have real faith, it just does not end with you saying, I believe. It allows the believer to develop the character that is founded on what he or she believes in, which is the true gospel. So, genuine living faith is not genuine living faith is not genuine if we say simply we, be, we believe but there is no change in our character. It allows the believer's character to develop. So, Christian maturity, next please, Hannah. Christian maturity is seen in the believer's journey. So it's a journey, huh? Christian maturity, let me read this very, very slowly. Christian maturity is seen in the believer's journey from believing to being morally upright, to being knowledgeable about God, having control over one's emotions, to being unfazed by trials, to living with a consciousness of pleasing God, to having a love for God that translates to selfless love for others. So did you notice that there is a progression? It does not just end, it does not just begin and end with believing, it begins with believing and progresses all the way 
to love for God that translates to selfless love for others. Now, I'd like to share with you this one. This is probably a checklist of, for Christian maturity for each and every one of us. So, for instance, siguro, those of us who are here in this room would say that we have gone through the stage of believing, correct? We are all believers here. Probably the reason why we are here because we believe, right? So, we have gone through the stage of believing. And in believing, we know that we are supposed to be upright in terms of our standing before the community, before our loved ones, before our church, before the government. We have to be morally upright. So, we have to be holy. So, there is this thing that our belief causes us to be, which is to be morally upright. Now, believing and being morally upright must produce a knowledge, more knowledge about God. So, meaning to say, if we just say that we believe and this is God, what God wants, why does God want that? It is because God demands of us holiness because He Himself is holy. And sabi ng God, be holy for I am holy. So, if we know these things, we become more knowledgeable about God. And when we become more knowledgeable about God and His attributes, we also have to have control over our emotions. Okay? So, we have to have control over emotions. I'd like to share with you one of the things I witnessed the other day. Um, this morning I shared this, but I forgot something to share when, when, when I shared this this morning. The other day, I was, I was looking for, I was in a very popular drugstore uh, in Santa Rosa. And uh, this particular drugstore, of course, all drugstores, by law, would require a what? Senior citizen lane to be there, right? Now, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when, when, the other, when the other pharmacists were, were busy with other, with other clients and they were attending to them, there was no one manning the senior citizen counter or the senior citizen booth. And then a tall, rather beautiful senior citizen uh, woman uh, approached, the, approached the, uh, the, the counter and she did this. Asa na ang mga tao rito sa counter na ito? Don't you know that this, this is the senior citizen counter, uh, counter? There is a senior citizen here. Where are you? Well, obviously, probably she was not feeling too, too, too well. That's why she was doing that. But nevertheless, the funny thing about it was this. When she opened her, when she opened her, her, her purse, out fell a small card, a membership card, stating that she was a member of a Christian church. So what do, we, do you see what I'm trying to get at? A Christian woman... A Christian senior citizen woman who happens to be a card-carrying member of a church, a Christian church, goes to the senior citizen counter because there was no one attending. And because perhaps she was having difficulty having control, gaining control over her, her emotions, what does she do? She bangs the table and asks, where's everyone? Where's everybody? I deserve to be attended. I'm a senior citizen. I am entitled to your undivided attention. So, nasa na kaya siya? Siguro tapos na siya sa believing. Tapos na rin siya sa morally upright. Tapos na rin siya sa pagiging knowledgeable about God. But unfortunately, hindi pa siguro siya gumagraduate sa control over her emotions. How many of us are like that? By the grace of God, sana konti lang, sana zero. No? Now, how about being unfaced by trials? Mahirap ito. To be unfaced by trials requires much, much time of believing, much time being morally upright, much time having knowledge about God, much time having control over emotions. Because to be unfaced by trials and to rely solely on what you know about your God being sovereign is difficult to put to the test. Do you know that your God is sovereign? Of course. Now, in the midst 
of seeing a loved one, for instance, in pain. In the midst of seeing a loved one, a loved one having to go through a lethal illness. In the midst of seeing a loved one being persecuted by other people. In the midst of seeing a loved one being defamed or maligned by other people. Well, how do you react to something like that? Do you say to yourself that in the midst of this, I will remain trusting, I will remain, I will remain to, I will trust God because I know that in the midst of this crisis, my God is sovereign. That's easier said than done, right? But, but, it is easier said than done, but it is really, it, it, is, it is capable of being done because still, your God is sovereign over what you can do. So therefore, it's not easy for me to say this, no? In my line of work, we see patients, we see people, we see brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let's not kid ourselves. I've seen a lot of you. I've seen a lot of you and how you handled trials. And by the grace of God, let me tell you this. For those of you who have, I have known personally and I have journeyed with in the midst of your health issues, I am blessed with how you have handled yourself. And I am blessed with how you became a testimony to the, to the understanding that your God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And he will always remain so. And last, of course, well, not numbers, second to the last, of course, is being conscious in pleasing God. Do you know what the definition of godliness is? Godliness is an attitude that allows us to put God first in everything. That's godliness. Putting God first in everything. Seeking to please God above all things. Godliness is the balance between the fear of God, the love of God, and what else? Fear of God, the love of God, and what? I forgot the other, the other leg of the triangle. You remember that, the other leg of the triangle. But it's the balance of all of those. You have, to be, you, you, have to, you have to be godly. And of course, finally, the highest of all would be after you've gone through the journey, through maturity, it will have to, the highest, the highest form of Christian maturity is one where we love God to the point that it is no longer about us, but it is about Him. And since it is, it is about Him, we love God, that we have a love for God that translates to us loving others as well. So those are, those are the milestones in our journey towards Christian maturity. Believing, being morally upright, having a knowledge, a sound and, and, and deep knowledge about God, having control over our emotions, being unfaced by trials, being conscious and pleasing God and loving God that translates to sacrificial love. Second, the second point as a summary is this. Our faith in Christ allows us to build upon it other qualities that make us effective and fruitful as believers. Third, how do we describe the, the faith that preserves and perseveres? The faith that we have, our faith in Christ, proves our election and thus our preservation by persevering in practicing the qualities that make us effective and fruitful. Perhaps I should just say this. Our faith in Christ proves our election and it is evidenced by us persevering in the practice of the qualities that make us effective and fruitful. Meaning to say, the, 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 the proof of our election is actually the practice of number two. Ganun lang po kasimple yan. The proof of our election and the proof of our preservation is the practice of number two. Reading to you from verses 10 and 11, which says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, what does it say? You will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be all the more diligent to confirm. So it's a command. It's another command. Notice that it encourages us to what? To be more diligent, to really validate for ourselves and see for ourselves the certainty of our calling and election. And if we practice 
that which we need to practice in terms of us journeying into Christian maturity, it says here that we will never fall. Now, what does this mean? For our own assurance, we are commanded to make our election and thus our preservation sure by pursuing the journey towards Christian maturity. And yet this journey's completion, this journey's completion, my dear brothers and sisters, is only possible by God's grace and His grace alone. No amount of mastering enough faith, no amount of mastering enough maturity can allow us to cross the bridge from believing to sacrificial love. It's impossible. It is only possible by the grace of God. And I would like to share to you at this point, one of the heads of doctrine of one of the documents or one of the, one of the forms of unity that all of us here in Bread from Heaven cherish. So we have three basic standards. Remember our three basic standards of faith? The Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgian Confession, and what is the third one? The Canons of Dort. So the Canons of Dort embodies what you may probably know as the five points of Calvinism. But in Article 9, in the fifth head of doctrine, there's this beautiful, beautiful statement of truth where it says, of this preservation of the elect to salvation and of their perseverance in the faith, true believers for themselves may and do obtain assurance according to the measure of their faith, whereby they arrive at the certain persuasion that they ever will continue as true and living members of the church and that they experience forgiveness of sins and will at last inherit eternal life. That is a very beautiful truth that comforts us. Ang sinasabi dyan, mga kapatid, is this. We obtain our assurance based on the measure of faith that we have. There's no pressure in us having a small amount of faith because from the small amount of faith, we must progress. So because of this, according to the measure of the faith that we have, we arrive at a certain point in our spiritual lives that we will be convinced that we are forever true and living members of the church. And we will remain so until the time that the inheritance that is meant for us by the Lord is actually given to us. But there's another beautiful uh, article, a statement of truth in the Canons of Dart, which says this. This assurance, the one that we now know to be true about our faith, is not produced by any peculiar revelation which is contrary to or independent of the Word of God. In other words, it's not simply by us feeling that we are assured, but it is based on the Word of God. It springs from God's promises, which he has most abundantly revealed in our word for comfort, that's one, from the testimony of the Holy Spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs of God. And lastly, basahin natin sabay-sabay, one, two, three, from a serious and holy desire to preserve a good conscience and to perform good works. And if the elect were deprived of this solid comfort, they shall finally obtain the victory and of this infallible pledge of earnest, eternal, earnest of eternal glory, they would be of all men the most miserable. So this is what's meant for you and I. So brothers and sisters, the faith that preserves is also the faith that perseveres. So having read that, let's summarize. The faith that we have been gifted with is both the outcome of God's preservation as well as the source of our perseverance. So that's what we're trying to say a while ago. That the faith that has preserved us, when you say preserved, what does that mean? What does that mean? It has what? It has prevented us from decay. It has prevented us from rotting. It has prevented us from being contaminated by the elements that would produce rot or filth inside us. So, it is said here that the faith that is the outcome of God's preservation as well as the, so is, is the same faith that is the source of our perseverance. Iisa lang yon. In what ways may we describe the faith which is the outcome of our preservation and the result of our perseverance? Let's read together, if you don't mind. Number one, our faith in Christ comes with both the power to equip us in life 
in, in, in godliness as well as the power to free us from worldly corruption. Sabi natin kanina, our faith comes with two kinds of powers. It comes with the power to equip and the power to liberate or to free us from worldly corruption. Second, our faith in Christ allows us to build upon it other qualities in us that make us effective as fruitful believer, believers, as evidenced by the fact that believing should not be the beginning and the end of faith. Believing should be the beginning of faith only to find yourself ending up in developing a love for God that translates in love for others. And finally, our faith in Christ proves our election and thus our preservation by persevering in practicing the qualities that make us effective and fruitful. Our faith in Christ proves that God chose us from the beginning of time, even before the foundation of the world. And, and this is the same kind of faith that proves that we have been preserved by Him. And this is the same kind of faith that allows us to practice the qualities that make us effective and fruitful. This is the kind of love that God has given us. God has premised in eternity past because of his love for us to give us faith. During the last, uh, during the last uh, Reformation uh, forum that we had in uh, the Presbyterian Theological Seminary where there, where there were many of us there, um, one of the things that was asked in the, in the, during the open forum was this. Somebody asked, did God choose to um, did God choose to decree the salvation of man as well as the, 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 sal the salvation of the elect as well as the, 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 the doom of those who are, have not been elect even before the fall? And the answer is found in Ephesians. In Ephesians, it said that I, you, ha um, uh, you, uh, you have been chosen before the foundation of the world to be conformed to the image of his son. So in other words, a decision was made even before the foundation of the world. So whether that decision was in favor of those whom God loved and does not favor those whom God does not love, a decision was made before the foundation of the world. And for that, we have to be thankful. And that should serve as one of the founding pillars, if not the most important cornerstone of the faith that preserves and the faith that perseveres. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise because you are a God who is so rich in grace and mercy that you have decided for us from a very, very long time ago, even before the world was made, that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Thank you, Lord, for the things that we have learned, that that which you have given us in faith is both the same faith that has preserved us from this corrupting, corrupting and corrupted world as well as the same faith that causes us to look to you every day and look forward to the fact that what we are to do should be pleasing in your sight. We thank you for these truths, Heavenly Father. And before we, before we uh, actually partake of the Lord's Supper, I'd like to ask the office bearers to come forward so that we can distribute the elements for our celebration for today.